Hello, I'm Dave Hart. I'm the preacher for the Winslow, Arizona Church of Christ. And I'm so glad you've chosen to join me today. Today we're going to look at a sermon entitled, Pleasing God, Pleasing God. You know, we should spend our lives trying to the best that we possibly can to please God in all things and in all ways. The problem comes in that much of the time we humans are often more concerned with pleasing ourselves or pleasing other humans. So it is a, it is a fight with us. It is a fight with us. And there's nothing wrong with finding pleasure in this life as long as it's nothing that's ungodly or wrong and as long as it's in balance with the other things that we need to be doing in life. And there's nothing even wrong with pleasing other humans. There again, the same conditions as long as there's nothing sinful or wrong or ungodly or out of balance with it. And of course, it can be a good thing to please others. Many people come to the Lord because people do good things or help them out or, or, um, or, or, or do things that, that please them. But we're talking about pleasing people over God, of making the mistake of, um, of, of choosing human relationships over our relationship with God if there's a choice to be made. And pleasing ourselves or pleasing others should never take priority over seeking to please God first and foremost. And if and pleasing ourselves or pleasing others lead to sin, then we must forego. We must forego that kind of pleasing. And to truly follow God, now listen to me, to truly follow God, we are going to have to disappoint a lot of people in this life. To truly follow God, we're going to have to disappoint a lot of people in our life. We have to make choices. We have to make choices. So let's look at some of the passages in the Bible about pleasing God. See what the scriptures say about pleasing the Lord. And let's start out today by looking at Galatians 1 verse 10. Galatians 1 verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So we have to make that um, decision in our lives. We have to decide who is our priority to please. Because you can't always please men. You can't always please yourself if you're going to please God. That has to be the number one priority. So we have to make that decision. And Paul is saying here, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to please men. I'm here to please God. And of course, he always had people upset with him, didn't he? We see that with Jesus. We see that with the prophets of old. They, were always, they always had people that were upset and angry with them because they were not pleasing men. They were not saying what men wanted. They were not doing what men wanted, but they were doing what God wanted. Now, don't get me wrong, we should not go out of our way just to make people angry or upset them or things of that nature. No, we don't do that. We don't do that. But if it's necessary, if it's a matter of they're again of pleasing God over pleasing man, we have to choose. We have to learn to be strong. And that's one of the things we need to teach in the church is to be strong, is to be strong. And that we're going to have to stand up for God in sometimes some very uncomfortable ways and some very uncomfortable situations. And it can mean that we're going to lose friends. It can mean we're going to lose family. I've known of many, many people who their family has walked away from them or they've had to walk away from their family in order to please God. Not easy decisions. I realize that. I realize how hard that is. But this is a fact. This is a fact that we have to make choices. And choices have consequences. You know, God gives us free will, and we have a free will to choose, but we don't get to choose the consequences. So, Paul, you know, Paul could have had an easy life. He was already, you know, one of the, he, the end crowd of the Jewish people, and he could have, could have had a very good life as far as life in this world goes. But he chose to follow the Lord. And, of course, we know that that choice led to, there again, consequences. 
consequences. Some of those consequences were not very nice, but he pleased God. And in the end, that's what's important. Because listen, you could be a man pleaser in this life. You can do all that you can to please people and make them happy and never do anything that might upset them or cause them to be upset with you. But you're going to have to face God someday. You're going to have to face God someday. And this life is very short. Boy, the older I get, the, the more I realize just how terribly, terribly short this life is. And it's going to be over and then we're going to have to face the consequences. We were, were we men pleasers or were we the pleasers of God? We were pleasers of God. So we've got to make that choice. We've got to make that choice. And, and there again, it's going to cause conflict. Now, uh, I don't like conflict. I don't like it. We, we always tease people about um, uh, being drama queens and, and uh, this last week, there was a, a, a young girl that came to our Bible and science class, and she had a shirt that said, no drama, and then had a llama, so no drama, llama. And, and of course, this, this young girl's full of drama all the time. So, so we were kind of teasing her and, and making funny of the, of the no drama, llama thing. And, and um, you know, when she would kind of act up or something, we'd say, no drama, llama. Some people kind of like the chaos and stuff, but I think for most of us, we don't like that. We, 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 we want to get along and we want things to run smoothly, but we can't, as Christians, get along just to go along or go along just to get along. We, we need to be people who are going to focus on pleasing God. People who are willing to say, no, that's wrong. No, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, I have people that, that criticize um, my Facebook ministry pages because they say, oh, you shouldn't talk about sin. You shouldn't talk about particular sins. And, and you, you know, you're going to draw more people of sugar than vinegar and, and all this kind of stuff. But am I going to be deceptive? Is that pleasing to God that, that we don't teach people about their sins? Listen, you look through Jesus' ministry. What's he doing? He's teaching people about their sins. He's calling them to repentance. You know how many times repentance is in the Bible and how necessary and vital it is? Well, in order to repent, you've got to understand that you've sinned. You've got to understand that you've done wrong. And no, I'm not talking here about being, you know, mean and harsh and looking down your nose at people. No, because, because we all need to repent, don't we? We've all sinned. But, but that doesn't mean that we don't point out sin. That doesn't mean that we don't teach others that what they're doing is sin. Because there's a lot of people out there in America now in this day and age that has no training when it comes to the Bible whatsoever, or very, very little of it. And a lot of them don't even realize what sin is anymore. No, they don't. I remember even when I was young. When I was young, I, I used to play the lottery. I was going to church. I was raised in the church, but never had any lessons that I ever remembered about gambling being wrong, about gambling being sinful. And so I started playing the lottery and and of course, later on, I realized that it was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I just threw money away. And, and it was a wrong thing to do. And I wish somebody had taught me that. So there were certain things that I did, even though I was in the church, I really wasn't taught or I really wasn't emphasized. And, and I went out and did some things I didn't realize was wrong until after the fact. And if we don't tell people, if we don't stand up, stand against these sinful things, people are not going to know. So no, as long as God gives me the strength and the ability to preach, I will preach on sin. I'll preach on individual sins. I'll preach that all sin is sin. And, 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 and even though I may sin differently than you, that doesn't make one or another right or worse or better or, or anything else. But we need to repent, and we need to stop wanting to please men. 
I remember seeing a magazine that's produced by, by members of the Church of Christ a while back. And basically they had a whole, a whole paper devoted to how we got to start softening our approach when it comes to homosexuality. Listen, I'm happy to do that as soon as the Bible does that. As soon as the Bible does, the Bible has not one good thing to say about homosexuality, so neither should we as Christians. There again, is it a special, unique sin that you can't be saved from? Absolutely not. We, we know in the book of Corinthians, it talked about some of those converts there who had been homosexuals at one time. Absolutely not. But, but we can't soften our stance on it. I've had people, I've had people come to the church building here and and, and, and tell me that their um, relatives are, uh, you know, homosexual. And, um, and I told them, well, that's not right with God. And they get upset at me. Well, this, you know, my sister's a lovely person. I'm sure that she is. I didn't say that she wasn't. But it's still sin. It's still sin. Same as people living together. Same as people living together. I knew a Church of Christ once that, that there, was, there was like six different couples in that church that either both were baptized or one husband was baptized or the wife was baptized. It was like six couples. They were living together and they weren't married. Preacher wasn't saying anything about it there. And, and I remember talking to an elder about it. And, and basically what they said was, well, at least they're coming to church. And, and that, that may sound good when it comes to our human thinking, but that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says that they need to be dealt with. They need to be talked to. And if they don't change their ways, they may have to actually be disfellowshipped. There again, that, that's what God says. Their idea was, well, we don't want to upset them. We want to keep them coming, and maybe we can love them out of this and love them into... Uh, listen, we we got we to gotta please God, not man. Yes, they may leave, and you'd hate that. You don't want that. You'd hope that wouldn't happen. You'd hope that they would do the right thing, and they'd get married and... and, and and, and, and become a, um, a you know a, a, a couple that this would no longer be a problem with, but if they didn't, you can't worry about pleasing men, because if you leave them in the church, you may be pleasing them and you may be pleasing yourself, but you're not pleasing God. You're not pleasing God. This is what I'm saying. To please God, it's going to take some hard decisions. It's going to take making some hard decisions. It's going to take making some decisions that you would rather not do. It's going to cause decisions. It's going to cause hardship on people. It's going to. It's about making decisions. It's going to cause people to get angry, to not like you, to say bad things about you. All those kind of things. But we have to be like Paul. Are we going to please men or are we going to please God? Acts 5 verse 29. Acts 5 verse 29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. We ought to obey God rather than man. So we're going to see some passages here that that there's a lot of times we are to obey man when it comes to the laws of the land, when it comes to having a boss, or, you know, a husband and a wife, a wife is to, to, to obey the husband. We're, we're, we're going to see and talk about a lot of that because in a lot of those cases, I would say most of the time, if you disobey, you are disobeying God. That's not making God happy because we're supposed to obey the laws. There's supposed to be natural orders of authority. It's there in the church. It's natural orders of authority in the church. Then to be in the home and in the government and, and at the workplace. But, but like Peter said here, here, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. If any of these earthly authorities and what they tell you to do comes in conflict with the scriptures. Come in conflict with the scriptures. It's either we obey God or we obey man. 
we are to obey God. We are to obey God. Now, we, we can't manipulate this. I know some people do this. They've done that. Uh, some people do this when it comes to the government. They just don't want to do something. They just don't, you know, we're overtaxed. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm, they'll, they'll find some religious thing to, to say, well, no, we're not going to pay taxes. No, we can't do that because the Bible says to pay taxes, doesn't it? But if there's a true conflict, if there's a choice that we have to make to obey God or obey man, we've got to obey God. We've got to obey God. And this includes the government, includes bosses, parents, husbands, and even children. Even children. Listen, one of the tougher things to deal with in the church is when when a child comes maybe he's 16 17 years old and he's been coming to church and he wants to be baptized but the parents say no but the parents say no these are some tough situations we have to deal with but in the end we got to obey God rather than man we got to obey God rather than man now uh, I want to reemphasize where there's authority, because all authority is from, is from God, we are to obey those authorities. We have to obey those authorities unless they conflict with the Word of God. And if they do, then we have to obey God's Word. And there again, we know the apostles did that, did this, and they were beaten for it. They were whipped. They were thrown in jail. All kinds of things happened. But they choose to, chose to follow God rather than man. We must do the same thing if we are going to be pleasing to God. If we are going to be pleasing to God. Colossians 3, verse 22. Colossians 3, verse 22. Bondservants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. So there again, we have to obey all authority. All authority is from God unless they are trying to make you do something that goes against God. So I was talking about servants here. You know, in that day and age, there was servants all over the place. Slavery was very prominent at that time in history, at the time of the Bible being written. And God didn't tell the slaves to overthrow didn't tell them to overthrow and disobey their masters. Does that mean God approved of slavery? Listen, ultimately slavery was, was um, uh, done away with many nations because of the Bible, because of freedom and, and, and those type of things. But the Bible doesn't directly say that slavery is wrong. Some people don't like that, but it's true. It's true. And in the time of the writing of the Bible, the, Slavery was a little different than the experience we had here in America. You know, the, the slavery spirits experience here in America was people were kidnapped from overseas and they were brought over here and forced into it and stuff. And did that happen in the Bible times? Yeah, that happened at times. You know, the Romans would go in and, and, and take over another nation or country or whatever, make those people slaves. But, but a, a lot of times people put themselves into slavery it was a very common thing to do at that time. Well, you know, let's have a contract. I'll be your slave for five years and you'll provide my meals and my clothes and a little bit of money and I'll do this work for you. And, and um, uh, you know, eventually in, in, the, in the Roman system, that slaves even had some rights and things of that nature. But the Lord acknowledged this was the type of government that they had and a slave was to obey his master. And, and, and if we were going to bring that up to modern times, you are to obey your boss. Listen, your boss may be crazy. Your boss may be off his rocker and be unreasonable and all that kind of stuff. But we are still to obey them. We're still to do the best that we possibly can. Uh, husbands, uh, wives are to obey husbands. But there again, people say, well, you don't know my husband, and he's crazy, he's off his rock. Well, as long as he's not telling you to do things that are unscriptural, even though you may not agree with them, you have to obey if you're going to be right with God. 
You're going to please God. Children, you got to obey your parents. You got to obey your parents. And I know children think their parents are crazy. I, I was just, um, uh, somebody had, had wrote on one of my ministry posts about how his children always got really mad at him because they'd always want to go out to movies uh, that maybe even the youth group from church was going out to. But this dad would always go and he would look. He would look at what the movie was about and how many cuss words and if there was nudity and stuff. And there was a lot of times, even if the church group was going out, the dad would say, no, you can't go. And and that's hard on a child. I understand that. But there again, to be pleasing to God, you got to obey your parents. You, you've got to obey. So... We can be pleasing to God by not obeying when it goes against the word of God. But other than that, we please God by obeying the authorities, by obeying the authorities. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. So we have to teach all men the gospel, even if men do not like it. There again, going back to what I said earlier about my ministry pages, there's a lot of people who don't like things on there. And, and they're Bible things. And they're not like, you know, they're made up things. They're Bible things. And, you know, either um, a Bible principle or, or, or directly a verse from the Bible, and they don't like it. They say, well, you're going to drive people away. You're going to drive people away. You know, Jesus, Jesus drove people away, and he didn't, never apologized once. He never softened his message. He never said, oh, oh let, me, let me say that in a different way or... No, he taught the truth. And people either accepted it or they rejected it. They either accepted it or they rejected it. And I tell you what, the church of Christ grew a whole lot better when we were doing more of that. Now, you, you look back to the history of the church, you look back to the sermons going all the way back to the early restoration movement in America. And you look at those sermons, they, they were forceful sermons. They were sermons that, that, that said it the way that it was. And the church grew better and the church was stronger then. The church was stronger then. Oh, I have people all the time saying, oh, you shouldn't say anything about the denominations and about false teachers and, and about the televangelists. No, no, if, if I didn't say things about those things, I wouldn't be pleasing God. I know I ain't pleasing man by doing it. I know because I get the comments. You know, I'm leaving your page and you're just too harsh and you're going to, you know, you're going to drive people away. And if it, this the denominational person saw this, they'd be so turned off. And you've got to preach and teach the truth. We're not here to please men. We're here to please God. And it says, but God who tests our hearts. So when you get the message, when you get the message, you've got to do something with the message. you either got to humble yourself before God and say, yes, I understand. And I'm a sinner and I'm a worm and I'm a, you know, all these things. I need God. I need forgiveness. I need to repent. Or you're going to harden your heart. Oh, I don't want a God like that. I want a God that can, you know, he's going to let me do whatever I want. He's never going to say anything harsh. And, 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 and listen, we know God is love. It's impossible for God to do something that's unloving. Because he is love. But sometimes we forget the Bible says to love God is to hate sin. God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. And, and, and we got to get the word out there. We got to get the word out there. And, and um, if we don't teach on these things, you know, sometimes I think we just think, oh, people are going to know this and they're going to know. No, they don't know. If we don't teach on sin, if we don't teach on specific sins, people don't know their sins. 
The world's not telling them that. They're not going to hear that at school. When they turn on the news, it's not going to say, oh, yeah, you know, these, 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 these uh, uh, transvestites are sinning. No, they're not going to tell you that. In fact, most of these places are going to tell you the exact opposite. How's a child going to know? A child who raised in the world sees their, their parents smoking dope and drinking and fooling around with other people and, and going to a school system that, that, that's teaching them ungodly things and other kids who are not, not, not going to teach them about God and they go to church and the church is too scared to teach them about sin. How are they going to learn that things are wrong, what, what is sinful, what is ungodly, what pleases God and what doesn't? No, we got to teach the gospel. we got to teach the positive. Oh, I believe so much we got to teach the positive, but I also believe we got to teach the negative. we got to teach the negative also. So it's so very, very important there again that, that, that we're not there to please men, but please God and pleases God for us to teach the whole gospel message so that men's souls may be saved. So that men's souls may be saved. We, we don't want to become like the denominations and pick and choose what we want to teach and then, and then twist that all around and just teach partially. You know, where they teach faith only. Do we teach faith? Oh, yes. You can't be saved without faith. But we don't teach faith only. No, because that's not in the Bible. So they're only teaching part of the Bible. And even that part of the Bible, they're twisting. They're twisting it all around. So we've got to be people who teach the whole gospel. And if they don't like you, and if they don't like the message because of that, well, listen, there again, I'm not here to please men. Oh, I want men to like me, and I enjoy when men... When men want to be my friends and I enjoy the praises of men, but I can't let that get in the way of putting pleasing God first. I can't let those saints get in the way of pleasing God first. Hebrews 13, verse 16. Hebrews 13, verse 16. Do not forget to do good and to share, for, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So we please God when we share of others who are in need. Listen, this, this life's rough, and, and there's a lot of things that happen, and there's a lot of troubles in this life, and, and um, uh, just a lot of things can happen. And we as Christians need to be there to help people, to help them out when we can, to give them a hand, not, not, not so much a hand out, but a hand up. To pull them up, to pull them out of wherever they're at, to, to help them on the way. And, and listen, uh, you know, talking about benevolence and things like that, it can be a hard thing. I've taken care of benevolence now in two different churches for a whole lot of years, way over 20 years, probably close to 30 years now. I've been somebody that's been in charge of basically over, over the benevolent situation of, the, of two different churches. And it's, it's hard dealing with people because there, again, there's a whole lot of people that want to stay in the situation that they're in. They don't want to get out of it. They don't want to make changes. And they just want somebody to take care of them. They just want somebody to take care of them. And, and listen, we're not obligated to do that for people. We're obligated to help people who want help, who need help, and who has a desire to do the best that they can. And we understand that some people aren't able to do that. Some people, you know, have physical or mental disabilities, things like that, and they're not actually able to do a whole lot. Maybe it's a real old person. But there's an awful lot of them out there that are able and capable fact, I keep hearing about, ever since COVID, how many able-bodied men who have left the workforce. How many, I mean, millions of them. I, I don't know how they do it. I, I don't. If I didn't get a paycheck every week, it wouldn't take more than a week or two, and I'd be hurting. But, but somehow that they're able to leave the workforce. And, and, of course, we have a great work shortage now. I watched a a YouTube video about some restaurants that are going to maybe go out of business in the next year or two, some very famous restaurants, actually. 
and talked about Denny's. Denny's was one of them. They said that, that there's a chance that, that the Denny's is going to go bankrupt and go out of business. And I thought, Denny's, well, they've been around forever. And you got Denny's, in, at least out here in, in, in the West, you got a Denny's in pretty much every town. And why, why in the world would they be going out of business? And it said the reason why is they can't get enough workers. They can't get enough workers. So we have these millions of able-bodied men. I imagine there's quite a few women also. I've never heard statistics on the ladies. And, and they just are refusing to work. Now, I don't know how they're getting along. I don't know what they're doing. I don't, don't know if they're living off the government. I suspect a lot of them are. Or they're living off their relatives. Maybe they're doing illegal things. I, I don't know. But, but the whole point is here with benevolence that we're going to do as Christians, with, with benevolence that we do as a church. We need to help people who are worthy of help, who are deserving of help. And then, of course, if we have the resources, we have the resources. You know, here in Winslow, and I know a lot of churches are like that, but, but we're a very, very poor community, and we have people constantly asking for help. And a lot of times it's, it's not just a, a mail or two. We try to provide that if we can. Uh, but, but, you know, it's big things. We, can you help with the house payment or whatever it is? And, and we, we can't always do that for people. We can't always do that for people. But we are to do what we can. We are to do good and we are to share. And just because people take advantage, just because there are lazy people out there, just because there are people who don't want to help themselves, we don't want to get our hearts so hardened that we don't help anybody. No, because God requires that. He requires us to look after those who are suffering from misfortune and who are poor and, and hungry and destitute and, and maybe physically or mentally um, in, incapacitated, things of that nature. God requires that, and when we do that, we please God. 2 Timothy 2, verse 4. 2 Timothy 2, verse 4. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlists in him as a soldier. So, here again, it says, No one entangled in warfare engages himself with the affairs of this life. If you're over in the battlefield, you're not really thinking about paying the house payment too much, are you? you you're thinking about winning the war. You're thinking about, about you know, defending yourself or protecting your friend or doing whatever is there at the moment. So, you know, the scriptures is not telling us not to have homes and not to have jobs or families and things like that. But it's telling us about priorities once again priorities. Our priority needs to be God's priority. And boy, that's hard. That, that, that's hard because, um, you know, I've talked many times that we need to keep God in the center of our life. That needs to be the most important focus. That needs to be the most important thing. But I, I believe for most of us, we have to keep putting him there. We keep putting ourself there. We keep putting others there, maybe our job or many, many other things. And I've seen people do that. I've seen people say, you know, give me the excuse. And most times it's just an excuse. Well, I can't come to church because I got to work. Well, I, I understand some people do have to work on Sundays, but that's why we here anyway. We have a Sunday morning, a Sunday evening, and usually you come to one of those. And if you're working so much that you can't ever make it to church and you're just working too much. You're putting that as a priority. People will put, will put um, other people as their priority. Well, I got relatives that are coming in and they don't go to church. I don't see them very often. And they'd be offended. They'd be offended if I went off to church and left them home. <sighs> okay, so don't offend your relatives. Just offend God. That's okay, isn't it? No, we, we got to realize that we are to be like the soldier in the battlefield. Or we are to have tunnel vision about winning the battle, about, about moving God's forces forward, about his agenda, and everything else, everything else comes in second.
Think about that with your relatives. Oh, I'm a Christian. God's important. You should go to church. We should. But yet when they come into town, you just made them more important. Boy, that's going really, to really help them to understand how important God is, isn't it? No, we, we've got to think like soldiers. We've got to be Christian soldiers. Love some of those songs, you know, onward Christian soldiers, marching as to what, you know, I, I think that those are great songs and they're in line with scriptures. We've got to have that mentality if we're going to please God. We are here in this life to please him. Not men, not ourselves. We are here to please him, and we got to get the right attitude. Psalms 147, 10 through 11. Psalms 147, 10 and 11. This is speaking of God here. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of men. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his mercy. So there again, it's talking here about, you know, the horse, you know, riding the horse into battle. You got to remember back in those days, that was like having the tank or whatever. And he doesn't take pleasure in the strength of men. We've always had, you know, we've always looked up to men who are strong. And of course, I've always especially have done that because I've been involved in strength sports and love to watch the world's strongest men competitions and things of that nature and watch powerlifting contests and all that and, and always have, have admired strength. But, but that strength means nothing to God. Strongest man in the world isn't even, I mean, compared to God's strength, he's nothing. He's nothing. But what God does take pleasure in is those who fear him. And the Bible tells us to fear God in many, many places, many places. And through the years, I've known people have a real problem with that. They don't understand, well, how, why am I supposed to fear God? And if I'm a Christian, I don't need to fear God. I don't need to. The fear is actually means respect. No, when the Bible says to fear, we need to fear him. We need to fear doing wrong. When I grew up, I had a father that I loved very much. I knew that he loved me, and you know we did some you know, some good things together, some fun times together. But I knew I didn't cross him. Nope. I knew I didn't cross him. If I crossed him, there was going to be consequence, and I'd get whipped. There was a healthy fear there. One of the problems we have with people today is that parents don't put instill that fear into their children anymore so they don't understand about authority and it helps them to not understand truly about God even. But I had that so I understood that if I did wrong, if I stepped out of line, I needed to fear the consequences. And it's the same thing with God. If I step out of line, if I do wrong, I need to fear those consequences. I need to fear those consequences, and they can be severe. They can be severe. No, listen, I, I've made some bad mistakes in my life. I've done some very wrong things in my life, and, and I have had to pay, in some ways still paying, for those consequences of doing wrong, of stepping out of line. If I would have had the fear of God like I should have had as a priority in my life, I would have never made those mistakes. And, and I wouldn't have had to deal with the consequences of those mistakes. No, fear means fear. We need to fear God. We, need to, we know God loves us just like a good father. But we also need to fear God as we need to fear a good father. And then it talks about um, also in those who hope in his mercy pleases him. So, so there again, God is a God of mercy. He forgives. He forgives. The Bible says he forgets. He forgets. He, you know, that's how much he forgives us. He just, he just forgets that we did it. And I am so grateful that he is that mercy, that he does have that mercy. Because there again, I've screwed up many times in my life. I've made bad mistakes. And I've done things that are wrong. And, and I need that mercy. I love that mercy. 
And we need to be that. We need to be merciful. There again, sometimes in the church, we don't want to show the same mercy to others that God shows to us. Well, he made that mistake, so it went nothing to do with him. Or, or some person come in. You know, we've had people that have come into the church here, been in prison, who've done some really, really bad things. And, you know, they have tattooed up faces and gang stuff tattooed to them and everything. And, you know, they, they've, they've told me before they've gone to churches and they've been basically rejected. And people looked at them, you know, I don't know, we don't want this person and, and all that kind of stuff. And there again, if, if I want God's mercy, we, we need to be merciful also. So I'm so thankful for his mercy. And we must remember to be merciful also. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Therefore, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Think about that. Whatever you eat or drink, even what we eat and drink, is, is this going to bring, bring glory to God? Well, well, well how can... And, and, and I understand the context of this. You know, it's just talking about things that are sacrificed to, to idols and things of that nature. But how could we... You know, how could we um, uh, not bring glory to God by the things we eat and drink today? Well, we can think about that. We're not supposed to be gluttons, are we? Um, maybe we should watch how much we eat. And that's not a popular message, but, but maybe that's something we should think about. And, of course, drink. Are you going to drink alcohol? Are you going to drink alcohol? You know, what kind of a message are you sending when you do that? I'm a Christian, but I can sin. I don't need to be sober. The Bible says to be sober. I don't need to be sober. No, we, we need to think about everything that we do. Whatever you do, is it going to bring glory to God? We need to think about the things that we say. Listen, we can say things, not not be thinking about it, or, or um, uh, even by accident done that many times said something by accident and and um, not bring glory to God we need to be people who think about the words that we say by the actions that we take we can take certain actions and will not bring glory to God we need to think about every action that we take remember hearing a story once about a bus driver and He'd, he'd pick up this guy, and this guy would always try and encourage him to, to come to church. Oh, you know, we'd, we'd lo- really like to have you come to church, or, you know, would, would you maybe come to church this week? And the bus driver kept turning him down and turning him down. Well, finally, finally, what the bus driver did was when the man came on the bus and he gave him his money, he gave him back too much change. He gave the man back too much change to see what he would do. The man went and sat down and looked at the change he got back, and he got back up to the bus driver and went back up and said, Hey, you gave me too much change. The bus driver said, Yeah, I did. By the way, I'm going to be at church Sunday. So he was testing him. So we need to think. We need to think even the things that we eat and drink. Is it going to bring glory to God? Every decision that we make, we need to look at through that lens. Will this bring glory to God or, or will it not? Will it take glory away from God? We take glory away from God. And we want to be people who do all that we can with our very lives, with our bodies, with our words, with our actions. The things that we do and the things that we don't do. It's going to bring glory to God. So there are just a few of the things. There's many other things we can do to please God. But there's a few of the things that we can do to please God. But of course, one of the things we need to do to please God is, is we need to be saved by him. We need to be saved by him. And the way that we do that is by hearing the word of God. You've heard, you've heard the word of God today. and Then we believe it. We have faith in it. And then we repent of our sins, we turn away from our sins, we, 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 we are sorry for our sins. And then we confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, for man and God. Then we're baptized for the remission of our sins. It's through baptism in which our sins are taken away. Listen, I want you to understand that. 
The only way you can have your sins forgiven is if you are baptized to have them washed away. And then after that, of course, we live a repentful life when we sin after that. But, but if we're going to get to that point where God is going to forgive our sins, we have to come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. And we do that through baptism. We, we have to be baptized. And then we have to live a faithful life. We have to remain faithful unto death. That doesn't mean that we're perfect. Nobody's perfect. That means that we have to stay faithful. We have to stay with God. We have to keep obeying him. And if we do those things, we have the promises of God from the Bible that we have eternal life of him in heaven. And if you haven't done those things, please don't hesitate. If you're not a member of the Church of Christ or not going to a Church of Christ, please find one in your area. Go visit them. Give them a call. Get acquainted with them. If you haven't done what we just talked about, those those steps to, to become saved, please let them know that you want to know what you need to do and how you need to do it. it it's, it's the most important thing you ever do in your life. If you're using this video as, a, as your sermon for on a Sunday, maybe you're a shut-in or providentially you can't be at worship service, then um, please don't forget the other acts of worship. This, of course, can be your sermon, but, but don't forget to take the Lord's Supper, to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs unto the Lord, to, to pray to the Lord, and to give of your means to the Lord's Church. I want to thank you so much for watching. If you know somebody that might find this video useful, please share it with them. God bless you.